Throughout this podcast series, we've nearly covered all of the original list of canon Conan gods I had researched over two years ago. Today, we'll be finishing up our list of over 50 canon gods in the Conan universe. To be clear, this list is simply finishing up those gods who are worshipped in the Hyborian Age. It does not fully cover the Cthulhu mythos, the Marvel gods that are fully compatible with Conan, the Thurian gods before the previous Cataclysm, or Hyperborean deities from 2.5 million years ago. There will still be many fun mythological subjects to go over long after this video. I would like to take this time to thank you for joining me on this journey as we reach the end times. As usual, my normal disclaimer applies. I claim no lore master status and will likely get things wrong when I overly passionately speak about something. So just be aware of that as we begin. Grimdark. Half off! If you'd like to see my progress as I make new content, enlist today through YouTube memberships or Patreon to become a soldier in the Grimdark Legion. My thanks to the men and women who've already served, whose names are listed here. You keep darkness at an affordable price. Obese and narcoleptic, Tasathagoa's massive intellect is matched in size only by his massive laziness. 2.5 million years ago, he taught many wizards great magic in exchange for human sacrifices, who are his favorite delicacy. Today, he is likely worshipped in secretive underground cults from the Pictish wilderness to Mayapan deep under the western ocean. Tsetha Goa is incredibly fun to talk about just because he comes with his own DLC expansion. Those series of underground tunnels, caves, and networks that I was talking about at the introduction of this god are called Nakai. And Nakai effectively is its own underground nation that exists separate from the underground tunnels and systems of the Serpent Men and other ones that might be the last surviving Lizard Men who were formerly Aramon worshippers if any of them survived. And we really do need to do just a Hollow Earth episode of uh, Conan lore, just any, any element, because it's so good and it's so underutilized and I could easily picture in a group of adventurers coming across a Tasathagoa cult and they ultimately function within a small part of an underground fortress that is technically claimed as part of Nakai, but it is located right next to a Serpent Man underground lair, and you have to now fight the Serpent Men because you messing with the Tasathagoa worshippers now accidentally made the Tasathagoa worshippers discover the Serpent Men, discover the humans who also already know about the Tasathagoa worshippers, and now it's a three-way war. And I would love every second of that. As for Tisathagoa himself, a fairly simple entity. If you take to him in this secret place human sacrifices, he will gift you with magical knowledge. Once again, we have a great plot hook for anyone who wants to be a sorcerer or perhaps a runaway sorcerer who, you know, they learned their magical knowledge. I, I instantly think of a sorcerer redeemed or a person running away from their dark past. Like, I know how to do this magic, but what I had to sacrifice was something like his own daughter or his own son. He's done horrible things. Uh, that could easily be a quest giver, a main antagonist. Uh, very, very, very good ideas there. Of course, another fun thing about Tasathagoa is just how simple his design is. He really is a big, near-gelatinous, tentacled frogman. And that's really all he is. He's Big Frog. The question of, are you in good with Tasathagoa is, do you work for Big Frog? Do you know people who work for Big Frog? But if you do work for Big Frog, you get frog spawn, or sort of greed hunters as I've dubbed them, of Tasathagoa. These are easily my favorite creatures to come from him. They were featured heavily in Clark Ashton Smith's original hype, uh, Hyperborean cycle. In the story they're featured in, a moneylender is lured into their lair through the idea of magic gems the idea. The the concept of magic gems that are purposely placed near him and near the greedy. So really they're just man-eaters. But these giant frog spawn, basically think of them as the frogomoths from uh, the weirder aspects of D&D. I believe I put that as the picture on the, the page graphic in front of you. And these creatures hunt by sending out fake gems and jewels that seemingly are actually just spawned from them. Uh, one great twist I would like to make, especially after seeing the recent episode of Delicious and Dungeon, uh, is the idea of them secretly being eggs for the Frogamoths, which I'm just going to call them Frogamoths because they never get an actual name. You can call them Frog Spawn, uh, to set the Goa Spawn, Greed Hunters, whatever you want to call them. But these giant tentacled frog monsters, which are very clearly 
spawn of uh, Tasathagoa, they will lure them in with that and then just consume them. They love taunting and sadistically torturing their prey. So unlike their absentee, lazy father, the personality of these frog spawn are incredibly sadistic towards those they torture. It's important to remember that while they share the insane hunger and desire for obesity levels of consumption that their father has, they are creatures that fundamentally are enjoying the pain of others. They're almost, it feels like there's a story being told of these frogamoth like creatures being abandoned by Tasathagoa to do what they want and being in kind of rejection and rage of that, and in many ways seeing humanity as the perfect thing to take out their anger on. So this is how these creatures hunt. Uh, it's just a very cool aspect to me. The short story it's a part of is very satisfying to watch just because the moneylender who gets killed is such an awful human being. Now, the second group featured heavily in Tasathagoa worshippers uh, and ultimately the body of the fellowship of Tasathagoa worshippers are the Vormi. And the Vormi come in two forms, and I think they come in these two forms. I'm going to go ahead and say that it's probably hierarchy of religious closeness or supernatural closeness to Tasathagoa, because it seems as though amphibian-like qualities do get bestowed upon some of them. Most Vormi, their basic form, are ginger-like yetis, and they're likely a form of ape man which we didn't cover in our All Ape Men and Conan video, which you should check out. But the Vormi are effectively just ginger yetis. That's effectively their entire thing. They are red-haired yetis. But in addition to being red-haired yetis, what they do is as they get closer to it, they become more like the Vormi of, well, Saturn is the planet that Vormi also exist on, but they become more like to Sathagoa. They become more amphibian. And while they keep their red hair, they keep their seismic strength. At the same time, their neck starts to cave into itself. Their, their neck almost fully disappears. And their skin, what's visible of it, becomes green. And they become more amphibian-like. They adapt all the positive qualities of an amphibian. They have like more control over how long they can hold their breath. They have all of these enhanced physical abilities that are based around being an amphibian. And a lot of weaknesses, obviously, too. I mean, they now ultimately breathe through their skin to some degree, in addition to breathing through lungs. So there's a lot of cool elements to that. They're a lot like Yeti Deep Ones at higher levels of Tasathagoa worship. And there's no reason why humans can't also do this, because obviously the human interaction with Tasathagoa is based around the idea of you sacrificing human, and in turn you get magical knowledge from Big Frog. You're working for Big Frog, and we're here to take you down. Down with Big Frog. We all know it. They're putting chemicals in the water. No, but... um. The, the issue of Big Frog is that you just, you know, you give him the human sacrifice, he gives you magical knowledge. Well, okay, let's let's talk about that, and let's talk about building up a real cult of Tisathagoa worship. Now, don't get me wrong, the Vormi are very cool elements, especially since when they reach a certain level of Tisathagoa worship and they go to Saturn. Saturn is also a planet that, by the way, Tisathagoa just casually travels to. Yeah, Saturn is a thing. That deserves its own episode. We do need to do the other planets in Conan because there are things on the moon. There are things on Saturn. There are things on Mars. There are a lot of things. But we'll keep it focused on what you would encounter in the Hyborian Age right now. And that is that a human worshipping to Sathagoa might be a good example for a red herring deep one. And that would be very interesting to me. That they worship to Sathagoa, they get closer to Tasathagoa. And in addition to learning all these magical spells, they also develop frog-like amphibian qualities. And it would be very easy for someone well-versed in Dagon worship or Dagon cults to be like, wait a minute, I know what you are, and then try to use something that wouldn't actually work on him, uh, or would work on him, but would misdiagnose it, and it would still be a good false lead into the larger Tasathagoa worship, which, of course, the Frogamoths. Oh, man, they, they, if you have an all-thief campaign... If you have an all thief campaign and fighting the the frog spawn of Tasathagoa, if you have a oh, oh, I love it. <laughs> and so we have the Vormi, which are more or less a testament to the fact that he lives underground. Tasathagoa lives underground. We have the frog spawn, who are more or less a testament to the sort of totem that Tasathagoa is most associated with. 
but we also have now the entities that are incredibly powerful, but also are a testament to his magical abilities and his ability to shapeshift. And actually, before we even talk about the Formless Spawn, let's talk about his own theorized reincarnation. And again, this could have been a half-human, half Tasathagoa. Half it could have been the end result of Tasathagoa mating with a human and playing with his uh, food, so to speak. Uh, and that is Kynagathan Zom. Uh, and no, I am not going to be able to pronounce that right. I am already terrible. Hycrania. Hyrcania. So there you go. That's that's me when I talk about Conan. But, you know, when it comes to this shape-shifting form, it does follow a more of a... I, I would say, when I'm talking about the theory that it's just Tasatha Goa incarnated, I don't agree with that. I think it's definitely a half-human because when it comes to Tasatha Goa... Tasatha to, to Goa is focused on one thing, and it's eating people. He doesn't eat them in this kind of grand, tormented secession like his frog spawn do. He does it simply to consume. He enjoys endless consumption and eating. And this entity, this kind of undead executioner, this kind of thing that just showed up one day and caused the downfall of an entire city 2.5 million years ago, well, he also enjoyed kind of this... I don't know, playing around. He enjoyed the concept of playing around with uh, different people who thought they could kill him. He would openly show, despite the fact that this entity, that this man-shaped thing was, could just kill anyone who, who could beat him, he just showed up for his own executions time and time again just to prove the, the, the sort of fervor of the human's wrong. And I think in that there is a kind of sadism and a desire to demoralize. And I think that from there, we can sort of extrapolate what uh, Zom was. And Zom, I do think, really, really was just a half-human, half to half Satago. I think he was one of the only examples we get of a demi-old one. You know, something like that. And I, I really enjoyed the story. All of this is in the Hyperborean cycle, which you should read. Everything, seriously, everything I've talked about, including the Seven Giasses, which uh, the Hyborian Archives just released a new uh, sort of rendition of which was very very good that I, I greatly enjoyed and you should check out it's literally about a guy who insults a wizard to his face one too many times and gets sent on the most th the longest diss trip that you have ever been sent on he is literally told by every single level of an underground which by the way is great for world building by an underground group of different mystics including serpent men including monstrous formless spawn that eat their own young that he's a jerk and that he's ugly inside and that no one wants him they don't even want to consume him and that's just how clark ashton smith wrote because he was great because there's all this not unintentional it's not unintentional it's clearly self-aware comedy for the sword and sorcery genre that he was writing for and, and Clark Ashton Smith definitely deserves all the credit not just for creating to Seth Goa but for making honestly some of the best stories I have ever read in the shared weird fiction universe of Smith Lovecraft and Howard now when it comes down to the formless spawn which I really wanted to talk about this again it they can take any shape and they do his bidding they are bound to their master uh, which is usually going to be an otherworldly entity or a very, very, very powerful wizard, mage, sorcerer. And what Formless Spawn are able to do is literally take any form. The only way to seemingly beat them is with the Elder Sign, with magic, uh, with any form of magical power like that. But of course, this is a Formless Spawn, and Formless Spawn have been adapted into D&D before, and you can easily use them that way. Personally, I just love the diversity of henchmen, of... Uh, cronies of worshippers that Tasatha Goa has. I love that you'd have the human cultists who are desperate for magical knowledge. You have red-haired yetis that sometimes turn into frog-like red-haired yetis that are desperate for his power. One thing I was trying to mention is that when the Vormi do eventually transform to the point where they do seemingly move into being uh, Saturnite uh, Vormi, the Saturnite Vormi uh, are actually cultured. They have an entire mating ritual. They have an entire culture where they have a queen that gets to the point where they mate with some of the best warriors of the tribe. And those warriors of the tribe then uh, are eaten and consumed by her after she takes their seed. And there's just like an entire thing that happens where they grow intellect over the course of worshipping to Uh So you have those three already. But then you also have the, you know, obviously you have the Frogamoths and everything else, and you have the formal spawn, you have all this cool stuff, 
running around with this one entity in addition to like i said before basically the black reach of the skyrim that is Hy uh, hyboria the much more diverse skyrim that is the mega continent of hyboria which is nakai and nakai as i said before at this time would likely stretch from the kind of entire western half of the underground of hyboria if not larger if not extending into the east all the way under the under the western ocean so you think about this your your next door neighbors with cthulhu we don't know where cthulhu is we just know that he's somewhere in the western ocean at this point but you're underground, you're next door neighbors with Cthulhu, and you're just going about your business as a normal, uh, you know, a normal red haired Yeti. And then stretches all the way into that very far off continent, just far, far to the west of Mayapan. And so that's definitely what we have when it comes to, yeah, when it comes to, to Sathagoa. I think that definitely covers it. Uh, let's move on to Nemain, a.k.a. Morrigan, one of the goddesses that would go on into modern times. Morrigan would be one of the gods Conan himself learned about as a boy before the destruction of his village. A Valkyrie-like figure, she is the goddess of battle panic, said to take the greatest of warriors dead on the battlefield as her husband's. So, Nemain in later Celtic mythology will be a very real figure. She is a goddess of battle who picks the best warriors warriors from the battlefield to be her husbands and black dragon tavern i can't recommend enough his video on the actual cultural figure now nemain is actually here because as morrigan the name morrigan she was mentioned in phoenix on the sword now mentioned in phoenix on the sword is a big deal just because it's the first conan video which does not conan video it's the first conan story published and that does ultimately make these gods canon but you can also tell this was very early it's when the inspirations for conan of celtic mythology were very much being worn on the sleeve which i mean as many people pointed out with iranistan the the, the inspirational you know the inspiration are worn on the sleeve still, but this was very obvious, and this will actually be the case for Manon McLear, and I believe one other god that we also have to talk about by the end of this, but we're also talking about Sobek today, so, you know, it, later mythologies adopting the Conan gods is really what we're here to talk about. But that's effectively what it is. She is a minor god. She is one of the gods that Conan prays to other than Krom. Uh, of Conan's home tribe, this was one of the minor gods. Uh, her main thing is presiding over battle panic and war. Uh, she is more or less the tempting goddess of sadistic war that urges you on and encourages you to go forward in battle. And this is just what she does. That's it. Now, we could also integrate the real-world mythology of her, which is what I think was ultimately Robert E. Howard's intention with her, because this is back when he was just straight up, oh, this, this is just the Celtic mythology, it's okay. Because originally, remember, Conan was historical fiction before the Hyborian Age was really written out. It was just going to be historical fiction. And this this stuff i mean all these different names which different tribes in the area of samaria likely had for her she's likely a sumerian specific god that was worshipped all throughout there i'm sure you could spread her around like many gods again very minor battle panic moving on i know we didn't spend a lot of time on her but that's it i deeply recommend black dragon taverns video and what he will talk about is the idea that if a warrior is brave enough and strong enough and dies on the battlefield, she will try to make you her husband. In that way, she actually has a lot in common with the Valkyries of Norse mythology in that way. And I think the concept would effectively be that there are different incarnations of her for each man. So in that way, she might be like an entire race of Nemains or an entire race of Morrigans who are literally just there to make a warrior man happy in the afterlife by giving him a true war instead of a war bride, a warrior bride. Uh, and basically challenge him even after death to be stronger and stronger in combat and always chase her through there. So that seems really cool, really powerful. So if you like warrior ladies, uh, Nemain, aka Morgan, is for you. One of the children of Jebel Sog and the father of Minotaurs, Pitior acts as a demonic guardian of marriage to his followers, ensuring male sexual prowess, protection from nightly harm, and the sending of his scariest children against cheating husbands. He is worshipped across Turan, Stygia, and Shem. 
the entry into Pityor is always going to be a basic fertility cult, and it's easy to find a fertility cult, especially with this god in particular. He's fairly commonly worshipped, and even then fairly commonly worshipped ag across three countries, one of which is very large, which is Tehran, another one which is Stygia, which is very commonly featured, and I'm sure will be featured in many people's campaigns, and then obvi obviously Shem, which I'm sure many people would like for its Old Testament references. Now, when it comes to a basic fertility cult, you know what to expect. There are fire rituals, there's this kind of big lead-up to what will likely be something of an orgy, or if it is separated, they have smaller tents for... They have smaller hippie sex tents, as you may uh, consider. But the real meat of talking about Pityor is, of course, that he's one of Jebel Sog's kids. And I really love the idea of Pityor, because whenever we talk about Jebel Sog... And it, obviously, if you're watching the larger supercut I'm going to make of all of these later, then you probably already have the section on Jebel Sog. But Jebel Sog's belief, after he, like many dark gods, was uh, sentenced to the outer dark, he coped with that trauma, like all the dark gods cope with that trauma, by saying, okay, this wouldn't happen if blank. And for Jebel Sog, that was, this wouldn't happen if all life was united, and that's why he invented something called the primal language. And this primal language can be spoken by all living creatures, beast or man. And his goal is uniting beast and man as one. And this also extends to plant life, etc., but that's not very important right now. When it comes to each of his gods, each of which uh, it is children, uh, the dark gods, they all embody each of them, you know, their own animal totem. Hanuman has the kind of bull ape, which in Conan is a gorilla aspect. The concept of Jill has the raven and crow dynamic to her. And then when it comes to Pityor here, we have the bull. And in addition to all of those, we also have the werewolf. So going down with all three of these, you have Hanuman and his various ape men who sort of is responsible supernaturally, mystically for, in a way, cursing humanity through their partial relation in DNA to chimpanzees, to apes, to devolve into that. That, that when the devolution of humans into ape men happens, no matter how it happens, it is partially due to the influence of Hanuman. And he, in a way, is like a hammer. He is bulldozing through when it comes to this. Jill, on the other hand, is obviously the Air Force. I mean, that's pretty much what she has to offer. Uh, we have her own section on that in part two of this same series if you haven't seen it yet. But she effectively creates harpies and crow men and these various different entities of bird folk to hunt and kill humans and rip them apart and tear their and flay their flesh apart. That's usually what they do to their victims. And both of these together make good front men for this system. You know, like, it's, let's say you had the forces of Jebel Sog united, and you would have eight men at the gates on the ground, the eight men army, and the air force of crow and harpy people. But then you also have the sleeper agents from within. This is where the werewolves come in. Right, so if we already have sleeper agents in the form of werewolves, and for that matter, his other child, Jamonica, with the were hyenas, though that didn't really go as planned, to the point where I'm sure that Jamonica is not, especially since he married into another demon god, he married into uh, one of the incarnations of Durketto, I believe. Yes, uh, he married into one of the incarnations of Durketto. So, I mean, I, I imagine they don't get along very well. I imagine they don't. Jamonica is one of his more forgotten children. But when you have werehyenas and werewolves, more werewolves than werehyenas, who act as sleeper agents on full moon nights for Jebel Sog, they will literally just rip out of their own skin in the middle of a full moon night and start rampaging without any control over their own behavior and killing humans. And then in addition to killing civilized humans from the inside, you have the eight-man army and the Harpy Air Force. What role then... After all that lead-up, after that four-minute rant, after that lead-up, what role does Pityor serve? What role does Pityor serve? What's left for him and his minotaurs and his bullmen? Well, what's left for him is the role of a cultural enforcer and propagandist through marriage. What is the oldest form of military propaganda that exists on the planet? It's the image of a beautiful, half-naked to naked woman who is on the side of the people who are going and killing and going and slaughtering. 
And what is one of the oldest sexual imageries in all of mythology? Well, obviously it's that of the bull. And what is the main thing that Pitior is focused on and associated with? Well, obviously that's male fertility. Now, while bull men are much more common than minotaurs, you have these super space marine looking men with, without any of the gross tubing or wiring of the space marine of Warhammer 40k. And then, in addition to the all these bodybuilding men, you would have all these attractive women following them. And this idea of, one, you know, propagandizing. Obviously, the fertility cults are an obvious form of propaganda because, I mean, you'll come join uh, Jebel Sog's side, you'll get sex. But in addition to that, you'll also have just the idea that our men are stronger, our women are more beautiful, and this, and of course they hide all the failed attempts at creating bull men. By the way, you'd, you'd be happy to know that uh, if you're a critic of Pitior, a critic of Sagian ideology like I am, then uh, you'll be happy to know that in addition to creating bull men, most of the, the king bull mating with women manifestations are gross, weird, inbred, uh, you know, dead infants. And to get a bull man, the, like, all these different conditions have to be met and usually takes a bunch of failed tries to get there. And in addition to that, the women are horribly traumatized because obviously they've been, you know, by bulls and by bull men and by just everything in town, really. So this, this is actually very evil, but the way it functions in terms of a surface-level propaganda is our women are more attractive, our men are stronger, and then, of course, you have the power of minotaurs. Minotaurs can actually only be created, and we talked about this before, the main reason that through the traditions of the Pitior cult, minotaurs are created at all is that the husband has been disloyal to the wife, and the wife is invoking Pitior. This is very interesting that, that the marriage bond or lover for life mentality exists within Pitior worshippers, because that's what the, the Minotaur is uh, more or less indicative of. But that if you ever, if you ever cheat on your wife or husband, they will do a ritual to transform a bull into a Minotaur. And this Minotaur will come after you, and it will hunt you, and it will kill you. So this idea of Pitior as a cultural enforcer and propagandist, and his cult as cultural enforcers and propagandists, in many ways serves the role of a tempter to come over to the side of destroying civilization. So, obviously, Jebel Sog's kids are always fun to talk about, because we have the good side of the barbarian archetype in our main character, Conan, don't we? Because he critiques civilization, he comes in and he says no to when civilization is too decadent to get things done. He says no when the legal system is too complicated and corrupt and real justice can't be done. That's when Conan comes in. It's a delicate, in many ways, you would never think of Conan this way, but in many ways, what Conan performs when he meets a civilized society is a delicate surgery of restoring the fallen heroism of the people he is talking to and dealing with. And if they can rise to that challenge, he will respect them. We have several evidences of that, but if they can't, he won't, and he may have to get into conflict with them, and he may kill them on his own journey to do that. That being said, the dark side of critiquing civilization is all of civilization needs to burn. You know, the, the millions must burn, things of that nature. And that's effectively what this is. Pitior is the Chud meme. He is Chud Pitior. And if you choose to worship him, you're probably, uh, uh, well, crazy. That's not good. Our final point on Pitior goes all the way back to the straight-up normal minions of the cult, which I really want to have that kind of ancient version of crazy hillbilly people slash the hills have eyes slash ancient chainsaw massacre deformed mutant killers that effectively exist in this cult. All the people who have to keep their faces hidden or hidden under hoods or only come to the orgy when everybody is too drugged up to say no. This kind of group of people, these monsters that just exist underneath the surface of this very, very powerful propagandist version of this cult, who have been taught to more or less aid. Like, I would love to see, if the forces of Jebel Sog reunited, I would love to see a few of these deformed Pitior mutant children who grew up in this sort of inbred cult aiding the ape men and helping the ape men fight and attack. It would be very, very interesting and very, very powerful. 
But that is effectively Pitior, and with that being Pitior, let's move on to our next god, Sobek. I've been looking forward to this one. A great old one who will one day hide as an Egyptian god, the obscure Sobek makes his home wherever his cave-dwelling cults may be found. Using the crocodile as his totem, he blesses his warrior priest followers with the magical ability to endow animals with human traits. Knowledge through combat is their way. So the first thing I have to do when talking about Sobek is without a doubt recommend to you Eradication, a colleague of mine, one of the only other Conan YouTubers on the internet, and his phenomenal video on this he did a while ago. Tasatha Goa is actually his favorite great old one, and I was meaning to do these gods, both of them in the same video a long time ago. Uh, I could have done a dedication to him. I don't know why he's not going through anything horrible uh, that I know of. So, you know, just go check out his video. Um, it's phenomenal, it's wonderful. We're going to be covering some of those same points here, but that video does function as a good companion piece to this section of this video. In the same way that Clark Ashton Smith was more or less responsible for the lore that we get on to Satha Goa, a writer named Robert Block, who would actually go on to write a very famous horror story not connected to the Cthulhu mythos, though you could consider it fan canon, Psycho, a very famous horror story, actually expanded on Sobek very prominently, and he did so in a story featuring Nyarlathotep worshippers and more or less a adventurer or an archaeologist going to this general area and studying this cult of Nyarlathotep. And in it, we get a lot of background lore on Sobek, Anubis, and how they were worshipped in ancient Egypt, and from that, how the Sobek worshippers in Conan Exiles, and how Sobek would manifest in his cults in Conan Exiles, why are these alligators and crocodiles so friendly to their worshippers. Well, we know now why, and that is actually something that I'm very excited to talk about. We're not talking about it yet. That's not what we're talking about first. First, we're talking about the cult structure, but we're going to be talking about anthropomancy, which is going to be a very cool, very unique type of magic that seemingly Sobek, uh, Bast, and, uh, and Anubis can do. Now, Anubis is also confirmed by Robert Block, his expansion of the Cthulhu Mythos, to be a great old one. That being said, Anubis is not featured enough in any Conan material for me to consider him one of the gods with power in the Hyborian Age, that is to say, not having a significant enough following. This is the same reason that Bast isn't featured here. She'll be featured in our Honorable Mention segment, and Jamonica is somewhat also featured in our Honorable Mention segment. If not, I'll mention him here. The reason we're not mentioning Jamonica is that Jamonica alone does not really have much lore to him other than he married one of the incarnations of Durketo, which would explain the degenerate behavior of hyena men. That being said, let's move on with Sobek. The unique blend of a Sobek cult is like many great Old One cults, they prize knowledge and they're after knowledge, but their fundamental belief is that the greatest way you can obtain knowledge is through combat and violence. It's genuinely a almost Cthulhu-esque riddle of steel, in which the greatest way to learn is by doing. And that's very cool, and this of course heads into great points made by Erad in his video, the cult hierarchy of fangs, warriors, priests. Fangs are the initiate assassins that have to prove themselves to the cult and prove their loyalty over time and ritual, time and ritual, eventually making it to the point where they are considered more honorable warriors. And then above them, you of course have priests who are skilled in that very, very cool form of magic called anthropomancy. Now, before we talked about the children of Bast in our All Beasts in Conan and All Werewolves in Conan video, the reason we talked about the children of Bast is that they're very unique. Instead of becoming beasts from a human, they're instead beasts, panthers in the case of the children of Bast, who become human. And in the case of the crocodiles that are more or less toteming Jeb, uh, <laughs> Jebel, sorry. no, that are toteming uh, Sobek, what we get from them is that their human priests are capable of using Sobekian anthropomancy on the various creatures that associate with Sobek. So in this case, crocodiles and alligators will say that because one of Robert Block's stories that expands on them also extends the influence to alligators as well as crocodiles because it is a story that is featured in New Orleans, I believe. Uh, and it is literally titled Sobek. So what we have here 
is this toteming animal that is blessed through anthropomancy to gain the intelligence and sometimes extra mutations, arms, mouths, etc., of a human. And sort of we get this mutant alligator that is just as intelligent as a human and loyal to the same god as their human partner. And what you have are these warrior ranger barbarians that are in search of knowledge through combat and these alligator associates, these crocodile comrades that are willing to fight alongside them and slaughter all in their path. And this, of course, brings up an interesting... an, an interesting overlap with Anubis, because Bast is unique in her anthropomancy, right? Because we have her children, panthers, who are being turned into humans, and that's her unique anthropomancy. Anthropomancy is literally just the magic of giving... It's what anthropomancy is in writing as well, which is when you give an animal human-like features and qualities, it's Looney Tunes, except it's not. It's very scary Looney Tunes. Uh, Bugs Bunny wants to eat your brain. That being said, we don't have examples of that yet. So how anthropomancy seems to work in Conan, because it's a magic we really haven't covered, is that there needs to be a specific animal depicted and totemed, and that totem needs to be associated with a god. And from there, usually a great old one, what will happen is, through the priests of that religion, that animal will then be bestowed with a human intellect, a human level of, of knowledge, or it's simply the ability to turn into a human, and that each god or great old one, whether it's Bast, Anubis, or Sobek, they fundamentally manifest anthropomancy differently. So I'd be very interested to see how Anubis manifests anthropomancy to see if he actually does have zombie jackal henchmen. That would be very cool. But when it comes to the uh, creatures that Sobek cultists hang out with, the idea of using an intelligent crocodile as a spy in Stygia, or using him as this kind of... Uh, just imagine one of those little baby crocodiles or alligators that make little laser beam noises, and using anthropomancy on them, increasing their intellect, and sending them out into the world. And just using him as a spy. And just... Meow, 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 meow. And it's and just meow meow meow. But and, you know, it's it's like <laughs> he starts he starts doing the laser beam noises, but in Morse code. Meow, 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 meow. And then it's just relaying information back to you. I think that would be one amazing use for it. But then in addition to that, think of turning a crocodile into something like one of the uh, I believe Croxagors is what they're called from Warhammer Fantasy. And just sending a caveman crocodile after someone. So if you want a cool lizard man army that is totally predatory, uh, seeking knowledge through combat, if you want to live out a grimdark version of the Ninja Turtles, but with alligators and crocodiles, Sobek is for you. If you'd like to listen to the canon Cthulhu Mythos story by Robert Block that confirms all that I'm talking about with Sobek below, you can find it in our source lists. It is... Uh, the Fane of the Black Pharaoh, 1937, you should find a link to the Horror Babble reading of it. My final note on Sobek would be, much like how totems of Tasathagoa are depicted as simply a big frog, totems of Sobek are depicted as, at this point in history, simply a statue of a crocodile or alligator, rather than, uh, obviously, rather than him being a crocodile-headed man, which he would be later by the time of pre-dynastic Egypt, but if you want to include it that way anyway, it, it's probably very homebrew friendly, especially since his main thing is giving you the power to turn crocodiles into people or crocodiles into kind of people, or crocodiles into mutant monster people. It's really up to your creative mind. You build your own crocodile monstrosity at home. The final notes on Sobek would be, generally speaking, even though I didn't really put this down in the notes, uh, it's important to remember that him, Bast, and Anubis all worship Nyarlathotep as a teacher entity figure, and Nyarlathotep is actually one of the gods on our list today, and you will be seeing a session on him later, but we also have a section on him in our All Ghouls and Conan video, which is very important since Bast, Sobek, Anubis, and Nyarlathotep are all also gods venerated and worshipped by ghouls. That being said, when it comes to the concept of human sacrifices, 
Because human sacrifices are a theme that runs through the entirety of Conan. And usually this, especially if it's a demon god, which isn't what we're talking about right now. We're talking about a great old one. But if it's a demon god, it usually has the purpose of a general hatred or malice for humanity. Almost all the demon gods take human sacrifices, and it's because they hate humans. So you are glorifying them when you're harming humanity in some way. In the case of Nyarlathotep, as you may have guessed, and if you are at all familiar with this trickster, hyper-nihilistic figure, Nyarlathotep literally finds it funny, so he makes Sobek and Bast and Anubis require human sacrifices later in pre-dynastic Egypt when he is worshipped uh, by them, and in turn, people worship those three. Now, you could do that here, but to the best of our knowledge, that is not, possibly not, the relationship he currently has with Nyarlathotep that might be later in time. That being said, these are outer gods and great old ones we're talking about. They likely exist outside of time, so we could go ahead and assume that Sobek has that current relationship with Anubis, where Nyarlathotep finds it funny for one of his followers or worshippers to be sacrificed on a pyre or pillar just for the entertainment of Nyarlathotep to see Sobek suffer because one of his chosen few must suffer. That's all. Let's move on to Manon McLear. Yet another of the minor gods Conan heard about as a boy at this time, Manon McLear would serve as an obscure god who presided over ocean, naval combat, and is meant to act as a guide to those born with sorcerous talents, lest they be drowned. Likely a Thurian leftover from the coastal Atlantis in landlocked Samaria, it's easy to see why this god is not popular. Man and McLear is yet another god talked about on Phoenix and the Sword, and that's why he's here. And that's pretty much all I have to say about him, other than he's the god of ocean and war. I will say, no, there is a fair amount of theory crafting we can do with Man and McLear, just because he very clearly does, and I put this in the intro bumper to him, which is just, yeah, he clearly comes from Thurian uh, Atlantis as a god, and that's just ge that's just geography speaking. Because, obviously, Samaria is landlocked, Atlantis was not. Um, and when we have these two factors put together, bing bada boom, he was likely a probably somewhat larger figure, but not by too much in Atlantis, and then comes here. And because of the nature of Samaria, he's an almost forgotten god. But again, he was mentioned as one of the gods that Conan swore by, and that's very interesting because Man in McLear is basically a Sumerian god of battle mages, but also the reaction Samaria culturally has to magic is to kill the mage very, very quickly and as soon and as brutal and as violent as possible to not bring dishonor, basically, upon them in the eyes of Krom because Krom is not a fan of general sorcery. So in the eyes of... Samaria, the reason Man and McLear exists, is, I guess, a safeguard. And the situation, the only situation I can think of where Man and McLear would be used, because he is the god of ocean in a, a country that is landlocked and does not have an ocean, but he is also a god of war. And in that way, he is basically ensuring that you were, if you are someone who, by some random fluke, was born with magical talent. I mean, really born with magical talent. You didn't study for it. You naturally had it in your veins. So there's something about you that's connected to the world. You have basically one option, which is that if you're going to be a mage in a barbarian tribe, you better believe you're going to be a battle mage and you will die in combat. And that is effectively what he is. He's making sure that even if a Sumerian is born with magical talent, he will ultimately go into and probably die in war, but as a battle mage. That's effectively good guy sorcery in Samaria, but also not because, like, I don't know. Man McLear would be an interesting god if you were... It almost feels like Geralt of Rivia. Like, if you were a naturally magic-born person, and that's not how magic usually works in Conan. Usually magic is the end result of people studying it and studying black magic. And even back in Atlantis, eventually Cull, uh, King Cull, Conan's ancestor, he does eventually launch a crusade against all dark magic, which ultimately is almost all magic, that isn't focused around healing and doesn't come from a divine source. So this very specifically is probably a paladin of Mitra leftover 
thing. And it's just very odd. If this section makes no sense, it's because Man in McLear makes no sense, and he is literally only here because he was on Phoenix on the Sword. Thank you very much for listening to this section. Moving on to Thog, who is equally as pointless if I'm honest, but much more fun to play with as a concept. Thog is nothing more than an abomination whose biology seems to benefit the oasis found in several deserts, most notably Stygia. While making plants or fruits grow by dwelling there, he also randomly takes victims from those who chose to sleep in the seemingly inviting place. And that's almost everything there is to Canon Thog. When you've hit the bottom of the barrel, you've hit Thog. But what would be fun with Thog is actually homebrewing him to be a race of Thogs. Give him the D&D treatment, because not many creatures are actually deserving of that, because usually it would hurt their image, because a lot of creatures are made less unique by the D&D treatment. But in the case of Thog, it's well warranted, simply because it seems to be a symbiotic being that benefits and helps oases grow in the desert, but in exchange does take human sacrifices, but that's likely part of a normal hunt pattern. It likely hunts humans as well. Effectively, it would be good as kind of an oasis troll. You could rename a thog to oasis troll, and it would be the same kind of enemy and the same kind of monster. It's not even particularly hard to kill for its size. It would be about as strong as a, well, I mean, that's still pretty strong, but a gorilla with tentacles and man-eating plants sticking out of it. That's, that's still pretty strong, but Effectively, just have thogs. Instead of thog, do thogs. That, that's my only note for thog. And that's just that he is an abomination, low class, ultimately demon god that is too stupid to be really capable of godhood. I highly doubt that he is a god because fundamentally, this is a creature that clearly was not part of Elder Knight. He was not alive during the time before humans took over. He's just worshipped and happens to be worshipped. And again, the only reason he's not in our honorable mention segment is that we at least have a knowledge of how he is worshipped, which is that he actually gets human sacrifices, and the human sacrifices are sent out to appease Thog in what is the most backwards and incredibly stupid attempt at appeasing a deity on this planet, because it's clearly not a deity. It's very similar. I feel bad for Thog, almost. Not not fully. It's a monster. But it's similar to the bat demons of Nergal that we're going to cover, because they're just animals. They're just beasts. That's all they are. And, and you're just letting them run around, and then eventually they get into a fight with a human over a turf war, basically. And yeah, of course they're going to die. Of course they're going to be killed. And so Thog falls ultimately under that. It would take four or five normal humans or two Conans, or actually just one Conan, to take him down, but ultimately that's Thog. Uh, a combination of gross plant life and animal life in one sentient creature that uh, does seem to, I think, genuinely benefit uh, Oasis. No proven benefit from worshippers. And that's about it. It's a monster, not really a... God, and it's not smart enough to tell the difference between prey that wants to appease it uh, or a normal snack. So ultimately, that is Thog. He's like a far worse version of Tasathagoa that offers you no magic and in return for human sacrifices, and you could have literally just given the guy a cheeseburger. Moving on. Likely re-emerging in history is the Greek god Apollo. Ilos is the god of poets, scribes, and harpers across the West, as well as Middle East. Often associated with the sun, rituals to him are done through song at noon or on clear days. Ilos is a fun, commonly used god. He ultimately is the god of poets, musicians, harpers. Uh, very fun concept with Ilos, uh, just because he's always subject to Mitra wherever he goes. He will very likely be incarnated as the god Apollo, and his worship is done in a very easy way. Um, he's always, again, subject to the will of Mitra, which would again imply this kind of figure that we would later see again with Apollo and that slight overlap with Baldur um, from Norse mythology later in history. Uh, and, and so I, I just I just like the concept of the, the figure just because people play bards on tabletops. They really like playing bards, and if you want to, well, here you go. When we talk about Ilos, we have to talk about the role of harpers, scribes, musicians. So harpers would be very specific. They're often played 
at royal weddings, matrimony ceremonies. So you could say in that way, uh, Ilos is also a god of good fortune for romantic relationships. You could also say that various musicians, so he's a god of entertainment, and then he's also a god of scribes. So if you wanted to be Felix, I believe his name is Felix Jaeger from Go Trick and Felix. If you wanted to be Felix Jaeger in this story, you absolutely could. You could be the uh, sort of charismatic bard that worships Ilos and enjoys his life and romances women on the side. And he is also, obviously, as I mentioned a few times now, an extension of Mitra worship. There isn't really much to say about Ilos. You worship him through song. You worship him through doing your act. Uh, if you are a scribe, then you worship him on a clear day by reciting scriptures that you have written to the gods to honor the gods, Mitra and Ilos included. If you are a harper, you honor him in the middle of the day by worshiping through playing the harp to the best of your ability. If you are a musician, no matter what the musician or instrument is, you worship him in the middle of the day by doing that same ritual. Again, same goes if you're a singer or a poet. You recite the poetry, you sing the song. And that is ultimately what he is. He is a god of the arts and the creative mind. I really like Ilos. He's very simple. He's a very good minor god. He is literally used all throughout the Middle East, all throughout uh, the West. In the West, he's more subject to Mitra, but in the Middle East, he can be worshipped as an individual god, likely subject to gods like Ehrlich, who take the shape or the kind of place of Mitra in these other pantheons. So this is something to look into. And if you're watching our supercut, then you already saw our section on Ehrlich. But if you didn't, then it's in part four. A final note on Ilos would likely be his subjugation in general to whatever the culturally dominant deity is and the most culturally dominant religion is, which would be a really great way to homebrew him into any other setting. So Ilos is basically your catch-all bard god who is always subject to the will of the most powerful god working. And while this is a homebrew... Uh, concept in the immediate just because you'd be tacking him onto a new religion. It would be very interesting to see how Ilos functions in nations that are more or less controlled by dark gods, but then you also have Ilos just kind of hanging around doing his harp and playing his music because it's like, well, I guess even demon gods like a good song here and there. In Shambhala, the city of skulls, there lies a truly horrific civilization that stands as a testament to the phrase Absolute power corrupts absolutely, for in this Meru civilization, the only law is to obey the priests of Yama, the father of all demons, whose word is final in all matters. Abuse, torture, and all manner of evil is common in the place ruled by the reincarnation of Yama's son, the Rinpoche. Now, when it comes to the real meat of Yama, that more has to do with his worshippers than anything else, and we covered this in 15 more human races and cultures in Conan lore. And the main reason for that is that Yama himself is, while an interesting figure as a dark god, his works, if he was something like a demon being studied in real-life occult demonology, he would be said to be a subtle demon god, because... Why would you even need to kill humans or torture humans when all they do all day is torture each other? The Meru civilization, which is very specific to the City of Skulls, Shambhala, uh, is largely based around the priests of Yama having absolute authority and control. And they are notoriously, deeply, and insanely corrupt, more so even by Conan standards. And this is a universe where as soon as something becomes decadent, their corruption is almost immediately evident. So we're talking about even more on a cartoonish level of psychopathic corruption, where they are openly committing acts of every horrible thing you could imagine against innocent people, um, against children, against women. And they're doing all of this under the knowledge that they will not be punished for it. So that is really where the evil of Yama worship comes from. But other than that, let's just enjoy the theology, the sort of dark theology of this demon god. So it has a parasitic cult dynamic, and the escaping from this kind of cult would be very interesting. And the interesting escape from that cult would ultimately inform probably a deeply traumatized character, if you have what it takes to play that kind of character. Because honestly, I... I there are very few settings, there are very few parts of any setting that I would say is too dark. 
But something about a person who's been abused in the way that Yama cultists abuse children and women is horrific to me, and for that reason, I might, I would never use it in a tabletop. I'll be honest with you. The City of Skull Shambhala sounds cool, but I'd probably homebrew that to be something else, even though this is amazing lords. It's wonderful. So Yama himself is seen as the King of Demons, and the King of Demons ultimately has a chosen people. The people here ultimately believe themselves to be a master race, to be the chosen of Yama, who were created in his image. And as they were created in his image and created the first man, uh, his son, the Rinpoche, the God King, will inevitably reincarnate throughout his life to rule them and ultimately go on uh, to become the next general king of the society in real life. We do not know if the reincarnation is real. Uh, this is one of those times, and I guess we don't talk about this enough in this series, but this is one of those times where Yama himself might not be real. His magic is never seen. His power is never felt other than the grip and horror of what the Yama priests have turned this into. Now, likely the way this plays out as far as the so-called incarnation of the Rinpoche, the God King, uh, would go, the son of the king of demons, this kind of omen uh, antichrist figure that is being worshipped here. Uh, basically, omen antichrist Buddha, because he, he reincarnates. Ultimately, he would be found, and it would basically be probably some street orphan, something of that nature, and be used as a figurehead. Because there's no way that they would actually give up the level of power that they have. Ultimately, the Rinpoche is a figurehead, and the real controllers are the priests of Yama, who will go on to abuse and torture and humiliate and kill, and just parasite off of the people of their small, secluded nation. I mean, it really is... I mean, if you want a nation of villains, I mean, just raw bad guys, it, this, it doesn't even require demonic influence. There is something that strikes a chord with each of us. I'm sure that I've hit a chord, touched a nerve in this series at some point with one of your personal grievances. And at some point, you, you know, this, like, I really like or hate this god because it hits on this thing. And for me, Yama is that one. Yama reeks of a real-world cult-like abuse that too many people in, really, the, the modern world in general, I don't want to just say America because there are many cults like this in South Korea. There are many cults like this just in life. The way they form. This is a kind of negative aspect of human behavior that still exists today and preys on the innocent every day of our lives. We don't know. We still really, really don't know how to deal with this instinct and how to stop it from forming. It is, uh, it's a very scary thing. And if you have the very, very poor fortune to encounter Yama worshippers, you have encountered such a cult. My advice, very simply, is to slay them where they stand, as Krom intended. Spoken of in the Grimoire, the Book of Dark Winter, Ithakwa was once likely the most powerful Great Old One before being cursed by rival gods to never again access his full might. Now, to bypass this limitation, he seeks to craft an offspring who can surpass him in strength by mating with fertile human women. So what's great about Ithakwa? Well, chiefly what's great about Ithakwa is that we have a clear motive and an understanding of why he is acting in the world. So why is he acting in the world? He wants to create an offspring that effectively he will toxically raise to get revenge on rival gods. And I'll go a little bit into those rival gods. They're called the Pain Lords. Again, like I said at the beginning of this video, there are infinitely more technically canon gods, but gods that just aren't worshipped. So if you want me to continue the list, just give this video a like, a subscribe, and, you know, share it. That's a good time to mention that. But the at the end of the day, his main goal is to create effectively the Ithakwa savior figure uh, by mating with the toughest woman he can find. He finds human women to be, for some reason, the key to this. So at some point, a half Ithakwa, half human figure will be born in his worldview and what he wants that will go defeat and conquer a group called the Pain Lords, which I'm just, I'm not going to get, this is a creation of August Durleth. And August Durleth, uh, people criticize him because he often fused classical mythology with his extension of the Lovecraft, uh, the world, his extension of the Lovecraft mythos. 
but let me tell you, it's a match made in heaven, because just the pain lords. Like, the, he's going to go fight the fucking Cenobites. It's wonderful. Now, as for the cults, I, I honestly think that the Book of Dark Winter is a great touch, since a lot of books and the lots of grimoires in this setting are kind of up for your imagination, but the Book of Dark Winter is a very nice touch for Ithaqua. Now, in addition to that, when it comes to Ithaqua's cults, the blood of fertile women, so the blood of women, is a main ingredient in almost everything they do. And they have this very unique culture in Ithaqua cults of creating murals depicting Ithaqua and depicting his great coming made out of paints that have within them the blood of fertile women. So the blood of adult women, really, but also you could say women who are experiencing their time of the month, which is a very gross image. All of this is gross. That's fine. It's a monster. It's evil. It's supposed to be gross. These murals effectively act as an attractant or an accelerant agent for when Ithaqua is summoned. Now, for Ithaqua to be successfully summoned, you need a pretty large cult, almost the size of a shadow country. And if Ithaqua is not successfully summoned, you will likely get one of his many, many followers instead. And this is a great transition into his monsters. First up are the Shantok. I really enjoy the Shantok. They're native to Borea, but they also come from other lands, such as the Dreamlands. However, the ones on Borea do seem to come in two various breeds. I've named them Chiroptera Shantok, who look more like bats, and Equestrian Shantok, who have more like a horse-like head and mane to them. However, that horse-like head and mane still comes with a beak. I digress. These two different breeds of Shantok both have the general body plan of wyverns, is something to more or less take away. So it's a very cool, very cool animal. They're not intelligent, they're beasts of burden, they are designed to be ridden, but they really do add to this feeling of a Lovecraftian barbarian entity. And it's one of the reasons that, well, not one of the reasons, but ultimately I did list... When we do these, you know, common locations of worship, and you should understand what those come from, the Hyborian Age eventually turns into Earth. And so, the areas that will transition into earthly cultures, in this case Mayapan Pictish Wilderness for America, where he is known as the Wendigo later in history, but then Hyperborea and Northern Turan for Antarctica, in which he will be known in his actual name, Ithaqua. But the reason Hyperborea is such a good fit is that Ithaqua cultists would make such a good third faction. You have underground Bori worshippers, which effectively function as the culturally active and culturally activist-like rebels trying to restore the old, freedom-loving Viking culture of Hyperborea. You have the uh, certain cultural supremacists of the day. You have the supreme faction of the day, which is the Witch Queen Lol, and her general weird self-worship cult in which she's seen as the queen of all liches and necromancers in the area and sort of a god queen. And then in addition to both of those, where you basically have a... Even though she's not a direct dark god, in many ways, she's kind of toteming Durketto. It's not really Durketto uh, because she is kind of being self-worshipped. And also there are several other necromancer entities she could be channeling. This is why it's best to keep her as a concept of a god queen. So you have the evil god queen who represents the dark gods faction. You have the divine gods faction being represented by Bori. You throw in Ithaqua and he makes the perfect great old one for this mix. It's why Hyperborea just works so well as a location for him. Regardless, let's move on to my favorite entities to ever learn about, the Nofke. Polar bears are already pretty formidable foes in any setting. They're the most intelligent form of bear, they hunt humans for sport, and they will track their enemies for miles and miles and miles before consuming them. Now, imagine if you gave a polar bear an extra set of arms, a unicorn-like impaling horn, and also semi-psychic powers and a human intellect. That is the Nofke. They live in the shadows of the snow, worshipping Ithaqua on many different planets, including Earth. They surround and stalk their enemies through the shadows of various snowy forests, waiting for their chance to strike, but because they worship Ithaqua, they're almost fully dedicated to, in many ways, founding an Ithaqua cult. 
And with many of these entities, you'd have to try pretty hard to summon one of the Nafke. And that's usually how it's done, for instance, the Call of Cthulhu modules using Ithaqua. Just because when in the Call of Cthulhu modules, you know, it's a pretty tough enemy to beat, even if you were playing Pulp Cthulhu, where people have more hit points and can do more damage. At the same time, when it comes to the Nafke in Conan, in Hyboria, you can absolutely, absolutely 100% use the Nafke as a kind of immediate enemy, as a big boss enemy of the cult. In fact, most cults will likely summon a Nafke instead of summoning Ithaqua, because this is kind of the ultimate fake-out. You can almost think of Nafke as pseudo Ithaqua, who actually have more of an appearance traditional to what people would wrongfully think uh, I thought what is. You'll notice on the page graphic I have, he's as much a Yeti as Cthulhu is a, cut a cuttlefish, right? He's not. He's he's not a Yeti. He's more like an interdimensional being, and he actively plays into that. Most depictions of I thought what these days, when he's drawn by different artists and fan artists, do depict him as this kind of ghostly, giant-mouthed entity that somewhat is humanoid, but not really. And that's a very good depiction of Ithaqua. But the Nafke kind of represent that traditional, almost Yeti-like image, but really it's more a polar bear with six legs that could rip you apart, and also is the intelligence of a human and is religiously devoted to killing what are ultimately fertile women, which is actually very interesting, because that leads into one of the things that grizzly bears are actually known for, which is like, uh, and it's... I don't know if it's true or not, but it's like a woman on her period can attract a grizzly bear. Well, a fertile woman can attract a Nafke who will smell that blood, go after it and spill that blood, and then try to go paint murals on caves and cave paintings to try to attract Ithaqua worshippers and followers, and possibly then go out and do outreach to other, like, you know, wilderness camping men. It's like, do you want political power? Do you want strength? Uh, one of the things that you will get if you are an Ithaqua worshipper is obviously immunity to cold because Ithaqua will, like all great old ones, he will bless you to be able to further serve him. And the first thing you need is strength to go capture victims. So you'll become strong, almost as strong, I would say, as a bear if we're using Nafke as the standard. And then in addition to that, you will get immunity from cold so you can live on Borea. Borea is his home planet and that's where he kidnaps most of the women from around the universe to go get there. A lot of them are human women, but... Uh, this leads into another aspect, which is the idea of homebrewing monsters under Ithaqua, just like sh uh, Shub, uh, <laughs> just like uh, just like the Black Goat. Uh, this is a very good opportunity for homebrewing monsters because Ithaqua could, in some cases, be thought of as the male Shub, because what he does is he goes around and he mates with aliens all over the universe, all over the galaxy, and he has many, many, many children with them, many different aliens. So you can, at the end of the day, have a million different snow-based homebrew entities that are just there riding Shantok into battle on behalf of their master. So very cool, Ithaqua. I think we've covered almost everything about him. I, I can't think of anything else to really go over. Yeah, let's move on to Nyarlathotep, a.k.a. the Dark Man. Easily the most personified of the Outer Gods, Nyarlathotep is a manipulative destroyer of minds and warper of souls for his own entertainment. Known as the Crawling Chaos, he enjoys disguising himself as a thin man made of pure shadow. Acting as a teacher figure to ghouls, he is also venerated as a god by great old ones and humans alike. Now, Nyarlathotep we went over in much better detail for ghouls in our ghoul video, so we won't be covering his ghoul relationship here, but instead be focusing more on how humans, humans themselves, worship him. And of course, you will have ghouls as an ally, and again, we have an entire video on ghouls, but we're not going to be focusing on ghouls here. Here is the time to study Nyarlathotep as he teaches humans specifically. So his incarnation in this instance would be known as the Dark Man. And this is actually another one that we can take straight from Fane of the Black Pharaoh, which is actually also the inspiration for Funcom's design for the Dark Man in the Conan Exiles Age of Sorcery missions where you can find him. The best way I would say to describe Nyarlathotep's mentality is that life is your playground. At the end of the day, he believes that if you have enough power, you should be able to do 
whatever you want, whenever you want, and I suppose he would like you more if you were entertaining with what you did, and the more chaos you cause, the more entertaining you are. And in that way, chaos as a negative element too, I want to be very clear on that, Nyarlathotep is an entity that enjoys causing suffering and insatiable insanity. So these are things like driving someone mad, sure, but it's also something like we saw with Sobek, right? We saw the idea of him having to sacrifice one of his own followers because it would cause him some form of anguish. Nyarlathotep is called the crawling chaos or the creeping nightmare for a reason. He is a monstrous entity that wants to destroy and corrupt and ruin all that you see, and fear is a beautiful delicacy to him. So, as far as the cults of Nyarlathotep go, again, we talked about Fane of the Black Pharaoh and the importance of that, but let's get into what that says about his cultists. Nyarlathotep human cults are a lot more subdued than the ghoul followers, and in that sense they have more of a structured hierarchy, usually worshipping within a kind of obsidian pyramid-like structure that can appear and disappear from human sight and then can often be disguised as other buildings, so there's kind of a very good cartoony magic there with illusionists and mirages. So the highest priests of Nyarlathotep are very talented sorcerers, but they're also specifically talented in not just illusion or mesmerism as it's called in Conan, but also conjuration and obviously with all the outer gods the fun part is what you can summon with them. And then under them would be other sorcerers of Nyarlathotep or followers or learners of Nyarlathotep. Under them would be assassins or foreign agents that go out into the world to make sure the secrets of the cult are kept at all costs. And then under them would be effectively kamikaze shovel head, uh, banged on the head magic terrorists. And I mean that, magic terrorists. They basically go out on a nihilistic suicide mission to cause as much fear as possible and chaos as possible until they are eventually slain. And in reality, we can assume that especially if Nyarlathotep is giving direct consultation, as he is known to do, because again, most personified of the Outer Gods saying it for the third time, if he is giving direct consultation to a wizard or sorcerer on their journey of power, he is likely setting you up in that position, because really, all of you are magic terrorists. But as you go down the line, this kind of position of suicide magic user is fundamentally, you know, more in your face and less talented in terms of trickery. So the lowest form of the cult are people who are literally just sent out to cause fear. One of the reason that Nyarlathotep is often worshipped alongside Yogg slash Yogg Sothoth, as well as being worshipped by a number of ghouls, is that he has a philosophy of cannibalism and fear-based madness, uh, making them different from normal sex. So we already kind of went over this, but generally speaking, Nyarlathotep does seek to cause the most fear as possible as a form of entertainment. But in addition to that, he genuinely does believe in consuming those uh, that he kills. And this can be done for one of two reasons. One is to turn you into one of his million favored ones, which we'll talk, to, talk about later, because he'll do that with his closest followers or his most entertaining followers, meaning people who've caused the most fear may be elevated into that position. But usually it's simply to have this final say and final control over the person. It's done largely out of an instinct and a desire, the same as a person eating a cooked piece of food. And I guess you could say the fear is the cooking of it. And the more soaked in fear the victim becomes, the more delectable and tasty they are to Nyarlathotep. And thus, he expects his followers to have a similar view towards their victims, meaning the consumption of victims, which is also, by the way, a great way to get rid of evidence, I suppose, that you've eaten someone or that you've killed someone. is just you just have bones that you need to crush and scatter instead of a whole body to get rid of. But effectively, that's the way it is. He wants you to cook your victims in fear before inevitably killing them and consuming their flesh to gain some semblance of their power. And it can be easy to see why many of his follower followers would both be ghouls and be turned into ghouls. Next, revisiting the idea that Set may be an incarnation of Nyarlathotep, we have the niche religion of fringe serpent people who do worship both Set and Nyarlathotep as one entity. Now, this is where the fan theory comes from, and it's perfectly understandable if you don't use it, but Set as Nyarlathotep is one of the religions worshipped by the serpent folk. So if you do want to use that, you can. If not, 
totally understandable. Effectively fusing the values together is obviously not hard, as they're almost, like, not fully, but they're almost the same entity to some degree. Obviously, both all have this kind of crawling element, both have very serpentine imagery associated with them, but when it comes right down to it, I can understand why people would be somewhat hesitant to embrace it. At the end of the day, with with Set, I mean, you literally have the slavery of humanity, Machiavellianism, being anti-human as part of his value system. So, eh, it does work, but as far as being the same entity, I can understand why people would want to keep them separate. That's just a disclaimer, because especially if you're watching the Supercut, and I have to readdress that, on the set aspect, I almost redid that entire video because of how, you know, poorly I conveyed that, but this is the way it is. It's just a fringe Serpent Man ideology. It has nothing to do with the mainstream interpretation of the god. The Million Favored Ones are basically your homebrew of a big bad. The Million Favored Ones have no specific form, and they're best compared to the Apostles from Berserk. The idea of a person who is in a state of complete misery ascending through the use of an external force. But in this case, it would be because you caused the most amount of fear, torment, and destruction. Nyarlathotep found you so entertaining that he wants to see what you would do in a new form with more power. And so, you would get your own grotesque, monstrous form based around what he wanted you to do or what you did in life. And I want to stress here that a million favored one does not have to be the head priest. It can easily be one of the sorcerers or just someone who managed to, by whatever ever means cause so much fear, harm, chaos, suffering, and disruption to order in a negative way that affects humans poorly, that Nair Lethotep just says, you know, he snaps his fingers, he goes, my guy, my dude, my guy, my bro, come over here. You're getting a cool demon centipede body with superhuman powers, and you can, like, fart tornadoes, and that's just your thing now. Congratulations. I hope you like it. You've earned it. I, I have big plans for you. Uh, spoiler, the big plans involve you self-sabotaging and self-destroying, uh, destructing yourself into a failure and being killed by someone else who will probably elevate after you, because this is all part of his theater, which is just very funny. To him, not to me, though I, I do giggle a little. Sent to the outer dark before the time of old night for trying to lay with the Queen of the Gods, despite his demonic status, Nurgle remains committed to benefiting life. He pays little care to his demons, allowing them to live as natural beasts, using spectral devils to test the resolve of mortal men. He is popularly worshipped in Shem as a god of testing. Nergal of Shem is very, very similar to Ehrlich. While Shem seemingly has no official religion to its country, Nergal does seem to be one of, if not the most popular gods, worshipped, and it actually reminds me a lot of the House of Troubles from the Dunmer lore of Elder Scrolls, where yes, they worship Daedra, which is effectively the, the demons of that setting, but they worship them as testers, that these are entities that are designed to be antagonists for them to overcome. And hence we come to Nurgle worship, or Nurgal worship. I'll try to pronounce it Nurgal because I don't want it confused with the smelly guy from 40k. Now, much like Ehrlich, Nergal is someone who is sentenced to the Outer Dark before the time of Elder Night ends, that is to say, before the time of the Great War between Divine Gods and humans fighting Demon Gods, and the entities that would later become the Dark Gods. Well, for him, instead of being someone who tried to artificially create life, Nergal was actually trying to more or less sleep with the chief god or the god in question that was currently in control. So we don't really know what the highest god would be. It might have been Mitra's wife. So it might have been Ishtar before the image of Ishtar was corrupted by uh, Shub. So when it comes to the concept of Nergal in this situation, we see him as someone who was championing life, but to a wild, inappropriate degree, and to the point where he needed to be chased. He needed to be more or less disciplined, and the way he was disciplined was being given this almost artificial state of being a demon god, this artificial sentencing. And I suppose another way in which that Nergal is different from Ehrlich is that the demon moniker is almost artificial. We count him as a divine god because he's actively trying to improve the lives of humans as he kind of always was. He's more sympathetic and loyal to his old desires, his old beliefs. 
as someone who more or less championed life in general. And we see that with his demons, specifically his spectral bats, who were his testing god. So, if you have faith of any kind, if you are a righteous man, these devil beasts of Nergal will literally run from you. They will literally run from you. They are f afraid of people with heroic faith and people who are willing to self-sacrifice. They're actually afraid of that. His demons are literally designed to test you, and of course he also has tests of strength in the sense that he doesn't really mind his bat demons. He does not control too much of his bat demons, though the bat demons you see in Conan as well as Conan Exiles are from his plane of the Outer Dark, and his plane of the Outer Dark largely just would look like a giant cave filled with bat demons and a throne room of him just kind of sitting there like, yep, mm-hmm. It's, it's King of the Hill. It's the King of the Hill scene where they're all sipping beer, and it's, it's just him, but it's, 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 it's yep. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right, you beat him? Ah, good. Good. The Hand of Nergal is actually one of the most famous artifacts in Conan, but you might not know this is actually a testing deity. And this is very interesting because Robert E. Howard find a, found a way to sort of hide the concept of the biblical references he's using, but effectively it is a testing that lasts almost 40 days and 40 nights. It's taken down only slightly to be the length of a lunar cycle and a few extra days, but the Hand of Nergal is effectively a test of kings. It's more or less designed to test the resolve and magical knowledge of a person by increasing their neuroticism, weakening their immune system, and bringing them very, very close to death. It is literally a test to see if you're worthy of being a ruler. And if you are capable of being a ruler, you will be visited by a shadow of Nergal who will bless your ruling of whatever you're trying to do, whatever effort of leadership you are trying to more or less maintain or grow. And they will champion you in the battlefield if you so need. So you will have the power to summon if you can pass the test of the Hand of Nergal. If you don't die from the Hand of Nergal or go mad, the return for that, the return for passing that test is Shadows of Nergal will aid you in combat and you will likely be a very wise powerful king. So that's the cool thing about the Hand of Nergal. Uh, it describe it, it's an ivory claw. Um, that's pretty much the image it comes with, though you could design it yourself. Um, I would say that personally, and we'll talk about this a little later in this section too, but there's not enough lion imagery associated with Nergal. Uh, he's supposed to have the head of a lion, the torso of a man, and I believe the feet of a man, and then the arms and wings of sort of a clawed demon or angelic figure. Briefly touching again on the Shadows of Nergal, the first note I want to make is an aesthetic one. Personally, I think Shadows of Nergal should look more lion-like, in the sense that they should be lion-headed men. And the reason I would say Homebrew depict them this way is that there isn't enough lion imagery to them. It really isn't. There, there's just all this bat stuff, but you don't know that it's a lion-headed deity. That's, that's really cool as just an aesthetic element. So that's the first thing. But the second thing to note about the Shadows of Nergal is that they will also give you wealth and riches as a reward. So you will now have the wisdom, the resolve, the, the wealth to raise an army to effectively start a nation. If you fail the test of the Hand of Nergal, you will become a monster or take your own life or simply die from a weakened immune system. But if you pass the test of the Hand of Nergal, you effectively become not just King Solomon, from like Ecclesiastes and Proverbs, but you become King Solomon from the Lesser Key, uh, Lesser Key of Solomon, where the whole story of the Lesser Key of Solomon is just King Solomon walking around, demon tries to mess with him, and he just says, nah, demon, you're my slave now. And then they move on, and that's very cool. So go be King Solomon, pass that Hand of Nergal test. Nergal, whenever you get gods like this, like Krom or Nergal or any of these that just really challenge the person and reward the accomplishment of that challenge, it excites me. I really enjoy this god. Honestly, this is the god I was most looking forward to covering on this list. Now, you also might be wondering, what are the shadows of Nergal? Well, if you pass the test of be the Hand of Nergal, you are. When you die, you will be reincarnated as a shadow of Nergal. Now you see, wouldn't it be cooler to be a lion-headed man than just a shadow? 
that would be much cooler. But effectively, you kind of function as... It, it, it is kind of an apt comparison to say that they are Nergal's angels, I, I would really say. Because, they're yeah, they're shadowy deities. They're kind of, in many ways, almost bound to his service. But, I mean, Nergal's not going to randomly kill you in the middle of the night. That's not how Nergal rolls. He might send a plague that'll test how well you take care of yourself, but nothing you can't overcome if you actually bothered to care and move forward and use an iron will. So that's what Nergal does, and you as a shadow of Nergal would likely be responsible for administering tests, and you would also be responsible for, in many ways, uh, delivering rewards and riches to people. You would also be responsible for, I suppose, in life, you would likely spread the worship of Nergal because Nergal is the reason you're capable of being a wise leader and king. So again, very, very powerful. I really, really love this god. All right, so final note for Nergal, even though it would be very, very rare, and I don't think it would be active that very often, he is a demon god, and that means he can have heralds. I don't really... I can't personally think of a plot hook for a Herald of Nergal, especially since Shadows of Nergal already fill that role. Now, if you don't know, a Herald is when a human performs a ritual replacing half of their soul with an aspect of their demon god, effectively turning into a half-demon. Now, the only reason I can think of for a Herald of Nergal to exist would simply be if you wanted to play Goliath from Gargoyles, which is a really cool concept, basically a lion-headed Batman. If you want to be a lion-headed Batman, then being a Herald of Nergal is for you. But a lot like being a Herald of Bente... We talked about that previously. A Herald of Nergal would be more or less in charge of honorable combat. So this is actually another example we might have of an honorable pro-life, much similar to Bente being anti-necromancy, an honorable pro-life herald of a demon god. So in this case, you would be more or less sentenced to hunt down or instinctively sent to hunt down sort of villainous diseases and plagues, and I guess you defeating the plagues and the demons in question would be the same as though the person in question had defeated the test. Though I like the idea of an honor code being present where you're not supposed to interfere with the test, thus you defeat the sanctity of it, and thus defeating the self-improvement aspect of it, which would ultimately be held very dearly by the Nergal worshippers in question. So I like the idea of an interplay with that. I think the Herald of Nergal would be an interesting, politically relevant figure for Nergal worshippers in general. Play with that as you will. Let's move on to our next god, Gwaler. If you'd like to represent your own demons on the battlefield, you'll need today's sponsor, Ronin Craft. Ronin Craft is an independent 3D model printing service with an excellent customer review score on Etsy. With a specialization in both sci-fi and fantasy, he's your one-stop shop for all your weird fiction needs. Because with Ronin Craft, you can be sure you'll get quality that surpasses any master. Known as the King of Darkness, Gwalaire is a classic Satan figure for any Faustian story, as he trades priceless conjured jewels for burned corpse sacrifices that increase his power after the rest of the gods ripped out his jaws before the time of old night. So, Gwalaire is another example of a phenomenal god because he has a simple motive, which is restoring his power, a simple matter of exchange, which is, hey, you want wealth and power? Hey, I want my demonic powers back. Maybe we could make a trade. And it's also a very cool thing because there's always a coming doomsday with Gwalaire because there's always the possibility that he could reattain his old power, he could regrow his jaws, so to speak, and I think that's the next thing we should talk about, even though I don't have it on my notes, is how he was ultimately banished before the the time of old night. But regardless, there's always the possibility that he could once again regain that title of true king of darkness and have the powers of both a divine and dark god fused as one. And that's very cool. Now, of course, Gualaire also has another element that I really love, which is that he is clearly intelligent and clearly willing to bargain with humans. And that's always very powerful. I always have more respects. He's the anti-thog. 
Thog is stupid, poop poop, 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 you know? He doesn't really understand how to do anything. He just kind of runs around in the oasis and tries to eat people. But, you know, Gualair, he'll come to you in maybe a dream or maybe the shadows of the night and whisper to you of a deal. And he does really do present that classical demon devil figure, which I really do like for any story as an antagonist. So he has a little bit in common with Aramon in the sense that he wanted the destruction of all the divine gods before the time of Old Night, before any military lines were divided. And the reason he wanted the destruction of the Old Gods is that one of the ways Gualer became so initially powerful, one of the ways his jaws, or fangs, so to speak, became so large, is that Gualer consumed the power of the Divine Gods of the Unknown Pantheon that he was originally a part of, gaining more and more strength from defeating them. And this obviously also included animal totems and various other groups. We can move from here into seeing the dress or garb that he informs his followers to wear. And what we have are these long black robes, but over these long black robes we have something that makes the garb very unique for the cult, and that is the leopard skins, the leopard furs that they wear over them. Now, of course, this has to do with the geography of the cult as well, so let's move in to that. I do like the specific areas where Gualer is worshipped. But before the geography, why leopards? Well, it has more to do with the fact that they are the most powerful big cat in that area to some degree according to the tribe that was worshipping Gualer. And when it comes to Gualer, you need to understand why I was talking about his jaws. The general nature of Gualer's loss of power literally comes from the fact that he consumed so many other gods that random gods, possibly gods from unknown pantheons, again, far, like, multiple pantheons, came together, ripped out his jaws, and sentenced him down into the dark place. He then used a leopard's jaws, according to some of the myths, though this was in one comic that I'm sorry I cannot find the source for. I have a huge source list underneath for most of what I'm saying. This one was on HyborianExiles.net, and sadly HyborianExiles.net was taken down. But he used a leopard's jaws to reclaim some small bit of power before ultimately using them to communicate and to start his cults and restore his true jaws, his true power, to destroy, kill, and eat other gods for his own gain. Now, when it comes down to the geography, I personally really like anything that expands on the Black Kingdoms. Just because we get so little on that, it was clearly where Conan was headed in terms of expansion. But what ultimately happened is that, you know, Robert E. Howard, as any uh, great creative, uh, likely had ADHD and wanted a break from all of his barbarian writings and moved into westerns before he inevitably, you know, sadly, the tragic end of Robert E. Howard, which if you know about it, you know, it's not something to mention on here. But yeah, no, locations first are Kashan. Kashan is a very interesting country to me just because it has a lot of, it's not expanded on often. Though it's, it's pretty fun to deal with, if only because when we're dealing with Kishan, we're dealing with something that has all these border regions. And all these border regions have different extreme cults that need to be more or less looked at for their influence on any kind of you know, in, uh, internal activity. For example, you have Punt, so they're right next to the country that is most known for making deals with shape-shifting hyena men. You're right next to Darfar, which means they're right next to the country that's most known for Yog worship. Right next to the Black Kingdoms, which means that there's a lot of unknown cultures. That's always the fun thing about the Black Kingdoms, of course, is that there are so many tribes within the Black Kingdoms that's a lot like the Pictish Wilderness, where you have like this high potential for homebrew, and of course their northern neighbors are Stygia. And that's, of course, very fun. But Alchememnon uh, is the he main headquarters of what is generally used for Gwalair worship. Uh, Gwalair worship, theoretically, even after Conan's interference, would be reconstituted there. Alchememnon is a very interesting city because it was actually founded by Shemites. And that's interesting because that's two countries over. There's no border between Shem and, and Kishan, which is very, very interesting. So, effectively, Shemite migrants came who already worshipped uh, Gwalair, and that means that Gwalair worship is here in Shem, it's here in Stygia, and it's here in Kishan. But that means they already worshipped them, and then founded through Kishans and through Kesha, Keshanites? Keshanites. We'll call them Keshanites. Keshanians. Keshanians and Shemites ultimately 
worshipped Gualaire together in this city, building up a temple of greed. And now from here, because of the very basic setup of what Gualaire is, what do we know the people of Alchememnon needed? Well, likely they were a very poor tribe that was surrounded by tribes that were much more wealthy and had much better funded militaries. So what happened? Well, the tribe of Alchememnon inevitably built up their not with Shemite leaders and uh, Kashanian followers, built up their wealth by sacrificing to Gualer the burnt corpse offering, so the slaying of their enemies, and then burning their corpses in offering to Gualer to restore Gualer's power and exchanging priceless gems, which they then used to found a city. This city then slowly begins to be decadent, you know, the cycle in Conan where obviously you have brave warriors and this huge drive to become successful and success inevitably defeats you. You know, they're the old uh, strong men make good times, good times make weak men, yada yada. That occurs and we have a full degradation where there are ape men above the temple, there are just all these things occurring. Um, you know, they're, they're just monsters that have invaded this city and they control it effectively on the surface and all the worship is done underground. It creates this wonderful dungeon. Alchememnon is an amazing adventure location. And then when we move into his worship in Shem, we should assume that Alchememnon obviously is the core center of it. It's where you're going to find the biggest Gualair temple and worship and likely the biggest statue to him. If you can see the images we have in our page graphic in front of you, these images are from the... Uh, temple one would find in Alchememnon of Gualair, but if we move into Shem, we should assume probably and in Stygia that there is hidden shadow worship because, you know, especially he's talking about Shem, which I didn't expect to be talking so much about in this episode. It's not like Nergal worship, you know? Nergal worship is accepted as this is a god of testing. This might be a demonic god, but a lot like Ehrlich, you know, he's there to test you. He's there to bring adversaries against you so that you might overcome them. You know, this is what they're there to do. But Gualair is just straight up evil. If you were found being a Gualair worshiper, you would likely be executed and tried on some type of court. Uh, the same would likely go, no, not for Stygia. And the reason that you'd, you'd find more acceptance for Gualair worship in Stygia is that obviously it's like a haven currently for dark gods. I mean, to the point where currently in Stygia, one of the main political parties is the Acheron Revivalists, people who don't even accept the fact that the ancient demon empire of Acheron enslaved humans, and they think that humans just did all that. That's what they think. They think that humans just did all that, and every dark god you embrace ultimately brings you closer to Acheron's prosperity and survival. So it's very interesting to see these three nations and their different takes on the god. You have a wide acceptance in Stygia, you would have in Shem a dark secret cult that couldn't be talked about, and you have in Kashan one specific city, one very specific city, and it is the haven and mecca for all Gwalair worshippers. And this is actually another thing, by the way, that could be used for an interesting plot hook in a story. You can have immigrants from Shem and Stygia on a convoy to Alchememnon. You could also have Shemites who are persecuted Gwalair worshippers moving into Stygia. Because here's the other thing, too. The Gwalair worshippers, because of how one sacrifices to Gwalair, do, despite serving an evil force, and this could be used for moral complexity, do not themselves have to be evil. Because remember, how do we sacrifice to Gwalair? How do you sacrifice to Gwalair? Well, it's just a burnt corpse, isn't it? It, you don't have to kill the corpse. You don't have to murder him. You don't have to stab him to death, though many cults do. So that's always an interesting element, too. How many innocents do they trick into worshipping Gualair, which I think would be more a Stygian thing, because that kind of is how Stygian, uh, Stygia ultimately functions. It functions on that sort of false intellectualism that is used to more or less disguise and justify evil. I think that would be very interesting for a Stygian Gualair cult. All right, moving on to our next point. Of course, every dark god has their personal claim to fame, and with Gualair we get the very unique, very cool signature mark of his kind of domain expansion, which is not even me trying to make an, an anime reference at this point. It's, it's literally, genuinely like a, an expansion of his domain. So how it works is this. Every single time a cult sacrifices another corpse to Gualair, his influence in the area becomes stronger. When this plus shadows are found, Gualair will begin organically, slowly making 
these shadowy sort of stone-like statues in the background. They'll begin to organically form. And what will happen is the darkness more or less encompasses the area. If you literally just leave it alone like a cocoon, the, the shrine you have to Gualair, what will start to surround that shrine are sort of soldiers that will likely protect the cult. And these are very interesting soldiers because the way Gualair's domain works is effectively through a unique, very unique type of shadow magic. It is not the manipulation of shadows, I can't stress that enough. It is actually the manipulation of things in accordance with whether or not light or shadow is on them. And it's designed to be a trap for humans and mortals who try to attack them as well as divine gods. And actually, when you understand that Gualair's origins have him specifically being angry with divine gods more so than mortals, and many divine gods having light attached to them, it becomes very, very, you know, powerful and, and very, very obvious that this was originally designed as a technique and strategy to deal with divine gods. How it works is this. In the shadows, these stone statues are merely stones. They are golems and gargoyles. They can look like anything. Sometimes they look more like Waller's demonic form. Sometimes they look more like humans. It really doesn't matter. But they will stay in the shadows forever. But as soon as any light whatsoever is shined upon them, that can be the light of a torch, the light reflecting off of a human eye, as soon as they're seen, a lot like the weeping angels from Doctor Who, they come to life with a vicious intent to kill all light. Life that is around them that is not Gualair. Sadly, this does include his subjects, but what were you expecting from a god that fundamentally desires the destruction of all divine gods and an influence of his power? There isn't too much control over these because they do seem to function a bit like automatons in a way. They do have a little bit in common. I'm, I know someone's going to ask this. They do have a little bit in common with the golems we see in Conan Exiles, but I think the golems of Conan Exiles are probably an extension from a Dark Horse original storyline, and that from there, that's kind of what they took, but it's also heavily inspired by Frankenstein and Conan Exiles. For my final note on Gualair, I'd really love to see an origin comic for him because I really like this idea of him experimenting with crafting and with growing his metalwork and jewel crafting over time. Because at first he creates these stone soldiers, which act as basically booby traps for divine gods who might want to finish him off, right? Because at this state he would be in a horribly weakened state. But over time, he sees human society. He sees that they really like wealth. And he begins to try to craft jewels, but right, obviously, initially, he wouldn't try for jewels. What's the, the most commonly used human currency in the Hyborian Age? He would likely be trying to use gold. Well, of course, what would happen with gold? Well, obviously, gold reflects light very easily, so it would just come to life and start killing things, so it wouldn't work. But the reason the jewels work, and this is my own theory on it, because this also informs the nature of his magic, what you see with the jewels is that, of course, the gems are clear. They reflect light. They are internally clear. They Light passes through them. Light passes around them. So they're always technically living and not. So that's always very, very good, and they can just be conjured in the shadows and traded in the light. It's very powerful, and it's very different from the stone statues, which do not reflect light, which work far better for keeping in the darkness, and then boom, booby-trapped, and, and you're, you're screwed. Moving on to Yajur, Kosala can seem like a paradise for merchants, warriors, and mages alike. However, this comes at a high cost. While the worship of the divine god Asura gives the people their moral compass, the allowance for sorcery as well as great farming is the result of sacrificing strangled foreign children to their blood god, Yajur. Now, Yajur was something that I was very sad I didn't talk about in my 15 more cultures in Conan, partially because that's just designed to be a brief overview of the different cultures, and in this case, Kosala, which really does have Yajur as a unique element. And the reason Yajur is a unique element is that while some people consider him to be a war incarnation of a Sora, at the same time, we do have several confirmations uh, from various different, uh, you know, Mongoose publishing books, various comic books, that Yajur is a separate entity that more or less watches over very specifically the cultural and environmental prosperity of Kosala. So things like getting good farming, getting good weather, uh, getting a lot of wealth, and also allows for their cultural allowance of uh, sorcery. And how that is judged and how that is used is always weighed against the practices of Asura, and that's why we obviously just have the Asura page in that, you know, 
bottom right corner with the Azure information. It's a very culture-specific deity and would almost go in the Honorable Mentions or Minor Gods section if it did not play such a big role in the culture of Kosala, which many people like and many people have come to me asking for more information on because they really like the idea of a culture that really does allow for battle mages. I suppose the two things to focus on with Yajur is one, it's a demonic god that is okay with being worshipped alongside a divine god, which is a very interesting element because in most cases, dark gods are fundamentally vindictive both against divine gods and humans. And then two, the fact that it is ultimately sacrificed to in a very specific way. You might be familiar if you're a Warhammer fan with the phrase blood for the blood god, usually referring to the chaos god Korn. Well, Yajur is a different kind of blood god. It indeed does not want the blood to flow, no matter from where. Because when you sacrifice to Yajur, what you want to do is strangle the victim and make it so that as much blood as possible is kept inside the body. The idea is that after death, the blood is consumed by Azure, and this blood in turn goes into harvesting crops and making clean water, which comes to the concept of who is sacrificed to Azure. And this is actually very interesting because when it comes to the dual practice of Asura and Azure, a different kind of sacrifice has been enacted. The strangling is something we will get right Right back to, but there are also sacrifices made of couples in which they are tied and bound together and then burned alive. Now, burning might be familiar to you because it's the way the dead are dealt with in the parent culture country of Venhaya. And Venhaya burns the dead to prevent necromancers from using them for their vile experiments, a very reasonable concern in the Conan universe. When it comes to the burning sacrifices, this seems to be them taking in a Soren tradition and using it to ultimately venerate Yajur, the idea also being that the burning prevents bleeding, and so you have this kind of ultimate theology intrusion into Yajur worship, which is very interesting to me. And also, of course, we have the example of some women, some wives, choosing to die with their husbands and Venhaya through the same burning, but this is forced on them in Kosala. Now, in addition to that, when it comes to the strangulation elements, well, who is strangled and why? Well, primarily the people strangled to death as sacrifices are the POWs of Kosala, so anyone they have gone to war with, criminals, people of that nature. But in addition to that, we also have the examples of darker cults of Yajur existing outside of Kosala. These are usually very small elements, usually very small cults and practices in which people are very talented sorcerers, but ultimately will strangle everything from men, women, children. It becomes a full-fledged dark god that I suppose is viewed as something of a necessary evil for the culture in question. But there you have it. There is Yajur. I don't really have much else to talk about them other than, I suppose, the unique mentality of Yajur. Again, he's okay with being worshipped alongside a divine god. This is usually something that is seen as something very hostile towards dark gods because, you know, th these are the people who helped sentence them to the outer dark. That's what it is. Every time you're venerating a divine god, you're saying they were right to sentence them to the outer dark, to the, what is effectively hell. And... It, it, eh... He's just like, yeah, you know, it's cool. I get my sacrifices, you know. Asura's teaching people to be nice, whatever. I Maybe, you know what would be nice? Because Yajur is never personified. We never get a personification of Yajur or a depiction of Yajur. What would be nice if maybe Yajur was converted to Asura worship? Something along those lines. But that's just theory crafting. And now let's move on to our honorable mention segment. This is our honorable mentions list, comprised of those gods who we do not have enough information on to expand on at this time, but do exist. Bass the Cat God will one day be worshipped by more than just werepanthers and ghouls, but for now is simply one of many yet to be venerated by mortals in any large number. This is also true for the rest of the specific ghoul pantheon, which we went over in our Ghouls and Conan video. My personal favorite of that lot is Bout Zuquamog, who is like Nurgle, but for Migo. Another Egyptian god, confirmed to be exactly like Sobek but for jackals, is Anubis, who is a great old one. The Golden Peacock is a cult never touched on that, from its name, is likely a wealth and fertility god centered in Shem. 
Uh, Anu is the cultural god of Ophir, which wants the Roman-inspired culture to stay intact, but it's simply an extension of the usual Mitra worship found in the area. Wakana is a minor goddess of healing, worshipped in the Polish-inspired culture of Brythunia. Nebthet is the puntish name for Durketo that is represented by an albino woman with a skull rather than the usual imagery. The Black Mother was an abomination worshipped as a god by a small gang-like cult of Tyrannian outlaws dispatched by Conan. Harkut is a hawk-headed sun god that was cast away along with Ibis, which was the Stygian incarnation of Mitra, and will likely later re-emerge as the ancient Egyptian god Ra. Alkir is a minor demon god in Ophir who demands sacrifices of virgin women in a stereotypical fashion. Shumagorath, while later being adapted into Marvel canon, was originally side-mentioned by H.P. Lovecraft himself before being stolen. All he desires is to be summoned and speedrun to the best of his ability the heat death of the universe. The same is also true for Hagoth, the great old one who takes the form of a giant tiger. He champions animal life, including humans, obsessively for an unknown reason. Jagta Noga is a demon who figured out how to gain power by entering other dimensions of the outer dark and hiding there. He has the personality and strength of a common human thug, despite being intelligent, and merely seeks to kill whoever he wants and get whatever he wants. While he may think of himself as a god, he doesn't have the vision for it, leading him to be a Saturday morning cartoon villain in a universe far more twisted than himself. His current hobby is tormenting Pictish tribes, which he has done since the time of Kull when the Picts were much more advanced. The Kalamtu trees are simply large demon energy influenced man eating plants worshipped by the Amazons who neighbor the Black Kingdoms. Men are fed to them to keep them happy in an ancient ritual that gives the women the ability to grow stronger and more powerful than their men, allowing for their subjugation. Finally, Astaroth was a powerful demon not to be confused with a demon god who convinced a small cult to worship him. His final cult was dispatched by both Conan and Bullet during Conan's pirate days. As an added bonus, I'd like to answer a question from a user aptly named for this series, Conan. Do the Hyperboreans worship any gods other than Bori? Specifically, the current evil ruling class of sorcerers. I tried to look through the Modifius book on gods and cults, but they only have Hyperboreans as Bori worshippers, which I know from your videos is basically underground and outlawed by the ruling caste. As necromancers, I think they may be Durketo worshippers, but that isn't in the book I have. Maybe they're just apathetic to the gods? If the answer is going to be in a future video, don't spoil it through. Uh, spoil it, though, just let me know. Uh, no, uh, don't worry, you're not wrong in any way. Yes, Durketo worship would probably be something that would be found there. But think in terms of a Hyperborean-centric decay. In the case of Hyperboreans, the modern gods there are apathetic, and the Witch Queen is effectively worshipped as a goddess. It's not an unapt comparison to say that the Witch Queen of Hyperborea is like an e-girl, and her army of simps are literally necromancers and zombies, brain-dead and heeding to her every word because of what a powerful necromancer she is. She is the most powerful Twitch streamer on the planet. This really isn't the way a, a Conan God's video should end, but we're moving into the conclusion now. Thank you for watching, listening, or just having me on in the background while you do other things. This format has easily been my most successful of any I have used over the years, so I'm proud to announce that for the foreseeable future, this will be the format I use to cover Conan content, but I'll also be putting the two opening quotes at the beginning that I did in my smaller videos, that way it still keeps a high level of quality, but it also lets me have my kind of podcast format. This has easily gotten the most positive reception from everything I've done. I hope you'll join us for the first of our long-form Conan lore series, whatever that may be. You can put it in the comments. I might do that. I might do something that just pops in my head. I mean, you know me by now. You've been following the channel. The ADHD kind of controls the channel more than I do. If you enjoyed this video, please share it with a friend. Post your comments, thinking about it, below. And consider subscribing for Conan and other grimdark content. As always, thank you for watching again, and have a lovely night.